It's my um, great pleasure to be here, and again, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here. So I was given the topic, measurement, state of the art, for, from the clinical perspective. And so having thought about it, I don't think it's the tools that are the state of the art, but the sophistication now with which we can use these tools. So we have a range of um, the other thing to consider, the difference between measurement versus assessment. Measurement, you want a, some sort of measure, like we heard this morning with the plastic surgeon, something to indicate there's been a significant change or not. Um, it doesn't necessarily inform you where specifically to treat. Um, for example, whole arm BIS tells you there's an issue or not. It's not telling you that there might be a specific problem in the forearm. Likewise, whole arm volume tells you there's a problem. Assessment is telling you exactly where the problem is. Um, so your circumferences are a great um, indicator of that. And we're now using BIS um, over segments to give identify where there's specific changes in extracellular fluid. Tissue changes is another measure. So you got to remember, are you wanting the outcome to be a measurement or are you using it to inform your actual treatment? So measurement of lymphedema, the common ones we want to measure, um, undertake physical, some sort of measurement of physical change, what's happening. And so there's, there's three tools here. There's water displacement, um, pyrometry, and the good old tape measure. All measure the same thing. They're measuring an indication of limb volume, including changes in extracellular fluid, as well as the adipose, the fat tissue. More recently um, is bioimpedance. And bioimpedance is quantifying specifically the extracellular fluid of which lymph is the major component. The good thing about all of these tools, if you use a standardized approach, is that they are valid and reliable. So you can choose what you want depending on what you want to do, what resources you have. In addition, um, there's measures related to the dermis. We're using ultrasound now, particularly for breast lymphedema. We've shown that it also is re reliable and valid. Other clinicians in Sydney are particularly liking the moisture meter for, again, measurements around the breast that are difficult, for breast lymphedema that are difficult to quantify. Um, it's essentially a localized BIS um, device. It's quantifying the fluid. So the tools now, where the sophistication comes in is whether you're considering detection versus monitoring. And for detection, it's based on whether you have the pre-event, in this case, surgery data, or whether you don't. Now, in Australia, in Sydney, there's one major hospital that routinely collects the data, um, BIS data, before surgery. The rest of them don't. Um, I know that I am, um, MD, no, not MD Anderson, <laughs> sorry, um, Mass General, they do that here. But there's a lot of places that don't. Um, more often than not, you don't have the pre-surgery data. So that's where our team focused. And this formed the um, thesis for my um, now colleague, previous doctoral student, Liz Dilke. And so we were interested in what are the criteria you use for lymphedema in the absence of that pre-surgery data. And so we see that there is data out there that suggests that patient-reported outcomes can inform it. But be aware that you can see changes. There's clearly evidence of change um, of lymphedema in the absence of self-report of heaviness. And likewise, women will report that their arm feels different or things, but there's no clinical signs of lymphedema. So we need to also look, consider the physical changes associated indicative of lymphedema. So we're er interested in the earliest changes. Um, theoretically, that there's no good RCT yet to show that if you intervene right at that very beginning, that you perhaps can change the course. But that's what we're trying to do. That's where we want to be at. Um, so we're looking to identify the earliest point. So 
What Liz was a history buff as well, and so as part of her um, background to her thesis, she went back in time and extracted all the different criteria people used to diagnose lymphedema. Some of them were based on normative data, but a lot of them were, this seemed like a good outcome measure. And we had things from one centimeter interlimb difference up to three centimeters, that they had to have it in adjacent segments, a whole range of different things. Um, so there wasn't one that, there was only a couple that stood out. Um, the ones that stood out, the most commonly ones you see are um, in terms of limb volume, a 10% difference or 200 mil interlimb difference. Um, two centimeter interlimb difference is also a common one used. Um, otherwise, there's a sum of arm circumference measures that you add them up, add the interlimb differences. If it exceeds five centimeters, people would be categorized as potentially having lymphedema. It didn't matter whether it was the dominant or non-dominant arm affected. At the same time, we have bioimpedance, and Lee and Bruce, who developed this approach, measured healthy women without breast cancer, without lymphedema, to determine what is normative, what's normal, and then said, okay, if you're two or three, well, at that point, it was three standards deviations outside normal, we're going to make a very small risk that we're misclassifying you, that you likely do have lymphedema. And you actually had to exceed it twice to be, have that confirmed that the likelihood of lymphedema. We didn't have normative data for circumference or whole arm volumes. So this was the first project that Liz did. She went out and measured women in both metropolitan and rural New South Wales, um, 212 women. And we used the parameter because it's efficient but did the circumference measures um, and whole arm volumes, did both the truncated cone um, method and the cylinder one. For each of those measures, what she did was for both the dominant and the do non-dominant, if the dominant or non-dominant was at risk, determine what was the normal variance for that level and what would be then considered as an three standard deviations, out two and three standard deviations outside the norm. And so this is an example from the whole arm um, limb volume up to 40 centimeters. Um, if you just subtract, subtracted the dominant arm from the non-dominant arm, you can see there are instances where the um, non-dominant arm is actually bigger. Um, and you can see that 7% of the 16% the non-dominant arm was bigger, and 7% had um, an interlimb difference greater than 200 mils. So there is variability with um, each of these measures. When we applied that to the whole arm, these are the two standard deviations above the mean, interlimb differences. Um, so if your dominant arm is the one at risk, subtracting dominant from non-dominant, um, you can see that at the upper arm, two centimeters is highly appropriate. You're in the ballpark there. However, down in the forearm, around the wrist, if you waited to two centimeters, you kind of miss the boat, that there have been, they're likely to have significant changes. If it's on the non-dominant side, you need smaller values again. We recently um, replicated this study over in Chi Shanghai, China, um, different body composition, so to see if it made it much difference. And actually, the interlimb differences were not far off. We measured 500 women, they measured for us, 500 women, and you can see that the interlimb difference was actually quite similar. So, down in the forearm, 1.5 centimeters, if you sort of rounding it up, don't wait to two centimeters. If you're looking for those early changes indicative of lymphedema, if it's on your non-dominant non arm. So we have that data now. What we wanted to do is look at what, what is um, the earliest signs of lymphedema. Ideally, we'd like to have a test like the pregnancy test. You could just dip it in and find out. <laughs> yep, we don't have that. 
We needed something that was unique to lymphedema. And so all of, there's been a lot of gold standards um, reported in the literature, reference standards such as water displacement, BIS, etc. You can't give me a value for those and say, yes, on this side they have lymphedema, no they don't. You need to have something independent. We use dermal backflow for lymphocentigraphy, from lymphocentigraphy is the indicator of lymphedema. And particularly, stage one, um, that we validated this um, scale. Um, Liz went over to Kentucky here where the um, nuclear physicians get registered and so conducted the reliability study with them. Um, so we're looking at stage one. Can we differentiate <laughs> them from others? And so we had the nuclear, um, we had the lymphocentigraphy and a range of clinical measures all in the same individual. We had women with lymphedema, with breast cancer, no lymphedema, and healthy women. And we used all these measures, looked at all of these measures. So normative-based um, ones on the top, the commonly used ones on the bottom. As indicated, the top panel allows, accounts for limb dominance as well as location along the limb for um, circumference, the bottom ones don't. And what we found is if you're trying to diagnose the earliest changes, it was the single circumference measure was the best indicator, the least sophisticated tool of all, but it's focal, it's localized, um, as long as you're applying where it is on the limb, the, the appropriate threshold. Um, and whole arm BIS, again, normatively based, was useful for detect um, detecting lymphedema. The single circumference measure had a higher likelihood ratio than the whole arm one. It's more specific. Um, and so we are proposing that it's not just a single measure, that life would be too simple. We know, for example, if a woman has central node biopsy, they have a 5% um, risk of lymphedema. We can use nomograms for that. So we have 5% here. They exceeded the um, circumference test. So we draw a line here. So this would suggest you're about 60% sure um, that that person has lymphedema. You also do a BIS test. So you can now take the 60% start with the down here at 60, go through the likelihood for BIS, and having those two measures, you now are pretty sure that you're up 90% probability that they have lymphedema. What we like to do is have others build on the nomogram, so um, other factors that we can feed into this. Radiotherapy to the axilla, that's changed. Can we add to this? So what is their pre-surgery risk, et cetera? Okay, the most important part of all of this is that it's based on using standardized techniques for your measurement as well. I'm saying that that sounds like swimple, oh, yep, know all of that. Um, I've just had an honor student look at, um, take three positions commonly used by clinicians in Sydney, and we see that their circumference measurements along the top here have very high concordance. If you measure um, a right, each of the, these are the um, distances from the wrist going along here. Measuring up here, a whole arm circumference going across, highly reliable. Okay, whereas down here, when we start actually looking at the interlimb differences, there's less concordance. Better up here, but if you start mixing up your assessments, it's a problem. So if you have pre-surgery data, you're really just trying to find the earliest change. Those are examples of ones that are commonly out there that um, you, they're all fine. We don't know which is the better because no one's ever done the definitive state study. But you are trying to find the earliest change. So again, you can use what you want. The other issue is about, is, is about monitoring change. What do we focus on? There's a range of measures that are out there, and what we're finding is that people are focused on the 
expressing the same measure, limb volume, 10 different ways, rather than trying to capture a range of different aspects. So um, here we can see dermal thickness. You can use ultrasound. Um, I don't know if the clinicians here, physios and OTs, have one available to them. In Sydney, it's not uncommon to. Um, caliper creep, we have bioimpedances focused specifically on the extracellular pitting test. Um, we saw a tonometer this morning. We don't have a good one um, available in Sydney, but it'd be great to have access to one that's reliable. Um, and then we have the volume measures. So capture a range. And lastly, but le not least importantly, are the re patient reported outcomes. We need to know what the patients are feeling and experiencing. Change in volume, whether it's you know, 15 mils, 30 mils, doesn't make a difference to them. Treatment for lymphedema is very costly. If it's not making a change for them, um, are we doing best by them? And so there's a couple of good um, validated, reliable questionnaires that are available. Um, you can actually access them. Um, part of the problem with doing questionnaires, people often don't publish the actual questionnaire. These are published, and they have very good properties. Um, and so include them in terms of your measurement. Um, so you can go back over a year, review what's happening, um, and take a stand back. So thank you. That's it.